Well, there is nothing quite like talking to yourself in the middle of an empty garage to make you feel like an idiot, but uh, when you dropped the engine off, you said if I ever get it running, let you know, so I figured I'd let you know. Um, so it's sitting in the garage that you uh, dropped it off on. I apologize for my absolutely shoddy camera work here. Um, I'm not scripting this, I am not practicing this, I'm just letting her roll, so apologies for everything in advance. So anyway, I guess we'll start at the bottom up. Um, it's on one of those uh, tractor supply horse pads, three quarters of an inch thick, uh, rubber, neoprene, something like that. It's fuel proof, waterproof, it's pretty much everything proof, and it wasn't there uh, previously because uh, I didn't think I needed it. The whole engine weighs like 1,200 pounds with the uh, I-beam frame and the generator and everything, so I figured what could possibly go wrong, but on the very first run, it walked itself from where it is pretty much right out the door. So uh, I figured that was no good. I got it jockeyed back into position, and I'll tell you, lifting the entire assembly with the uh, with everything put together so I could get that mat under it was no fun whatsoever, but uh, it did get done. And uh, once it was on this mat, it actually started walking on the mat also. The friction between these steel I-beams and that rubber just wasn't as much as I thought it would be. So you talk about uh, stupid Yankee engineering. I put the... Uh, I put some of these 2x6s here and then just drywall screwed it right into the rubber. The lateral forces weren't very hard, so it didn't really make a lick of difference. Um, it didn't really try to push itself one side to the other too much at all. So that little bit of uh, between there and there and over here and a little bit on the front. And uh, it doesn't walk anywhere at all. It stays nice and solid, so no complaints on that. I as much as that was a, a temporary solution, it might end up being the permanent solution as well. Um, I had the uh, I had these four by four I beams uh, cut up, welded them together, painted them all. So the uh, the engine bolts to those with five eighths inch bolts. Uh, everything's nice and lagged down. The casting for this uh, engine frame was actually surprisingly good. I was expecting to have to shim one of these bolts or something to. Uh, get it to not rock, but for as much stuff on this engine that was out of whack, the uh, the bolts and everything in the in the frame was was perfect. Uh, no complaints on that. It bolted right down. The generator. Um, let's see if we can get around here. Sits on a carriage. So if, let's see if we can get around there. If you can see that, the generator sits on this frame, and these. Ha, get the lens cap out of the way, silly. So the generator sits on this carriage inside. Let's see if we can get a better angle of that. There we go. If you can see that. So it actually slides almost like tracks uh, up and down on this uh, on the inside of the I-beam frame over here. It's tensioned with this three-quarter inch uh, threaded rod that goes underneath and uh, can push the whole generator assembly back and forth and that's what tightens the belt. Uh, this is the belt that you supply, and it's absolutely perfect. No complaints on that. Uh, everything uh, socked up fine. That's a little piece of reflective tape for my tachometer to get the uh, speed set properly. So why don't I just kind of go through what worked on this thing and what didn't. Um, most of the parts I, I did take the, uh, the valve cover off because it's just decorative, and strangely, resonates fiercely at speed. So I leave it with the, uh, with the cover on, when I'm not using the engine, but when it's time to use it, I take it right off because uh, it resonates badly. It makes the engine uh, so much louder than it actually should be. Very strange. Um, I am using the stock air cleaner that came with it. Um, I don't really like it too much. I don't think it's a, a particularly good filter, good enough for testing, but I did. Follow me over here. I guess you don't have a choice. I'm the one holding the camera. Come over here, and this is a, uh, that's a filter off a uh, John Deere uh, diesel uh, tractor, so I'm gonna hook that up to its double stage filtration should do a very nice job I'll mount that um, Either somewhere down in here or if I get this in a more permanent location I might mount it on the wall or something just to uh, make it easier to service and have it not be too much in the way uh, the stock filter or, or stock filter nothing the stock exhaust was a uh, exhaust uh, silencer in name only. It uh, I think actually made it louder. So uh, this is a AutoZone um, absolutely generic muffler. It doesn't do, um, I mean it doesn't particularly fit any car. It's just for, you know, whatever, m working on your own stuff. But that does a dang fine job. Uh, I used my uh, lathe to cut this interface here. 
uh, on the engine so that it would slide into that and clamp right up a little bit of uh, ultra high temperature RTV there just to keep the uh, ceiling working well. And then uh, I machined up this piece over here. That's just a two inch piece of uh, galvanized black iron. Does that make it silver iron? Um, and that just goes into the muffler and then I can, from there I can just use standard pipe fittings. Right now the exhaust is uh, quite rudimentary. It um, is just two inch black iron all the way down and uh, that just goes out to the bottom of the garage door over here. So I take this bottom section of pipe here off and uh, that way the garage door is closed. But when I want to use the engine, I just lift the garage door, put that a uh, couple feet worth of black iron just to get the exhaust out. And uh, according to the carbon monoxide detector and uh, my nose and everything else, uh, all the exhaust goes outside. There's no leaks, no problems. And uh, it actually makes the outside much, much quieter. This little bit of system over here holding the exhaust pipe up, that is absolutely temporary. Um, just, to, uh, just to get the thing held up right now, I will replace that, but I figured it's good enough for now. The exhaust pipe, the, the muffler itself gets quite hot but um, it never exceeds about 250 degrees here, so I'm not worried about the wood at all. In fact, by the time the exhaust cools down on this downpipe here, uh, you'll notice I actually have just a section of cardboard shimming that. That's so, uh, so really the exhaust temperature down there, at least by my infrared thermometer, uh, never really goes higher than about 200 degrees. It cools down quite a bit on that downpipe, so it doesn't, it's not a threat to the rubber mat or the cardboard or anything. Um, still not ideal, but we'll get there. Uh, the engine was completely taken apart. I mean, every nut, bolt, screw, everything taken out of it. If, uh, if I'm getting any good with the editing software, I'll try to throw some still frames at the end of this. Um, I did take the valves out and the cam and all that, and I put them up on the lathe, polished everything with um, 3000 grit, at least working my way down to it, polished everything, because the machining on these was absolutely horrible. It was just the worst. Um, I don't know what the guys in India were thinking, but uh, this engine would not have lasted long if I hadn't done that. The governor was terrible. Uh, it was actually completely rusted inside, probably just from sitting without having had any oil on it. But the uh, flyweights inside are, are cast iron, and they were literally crumbling. They had so much scale and rust on them. They polished up okay with a wire wheel, so they just went right back in when I was done. But all the surfaces got polished. The uh, injection pump I took apart because it was loaded with crud. Um, everything else over here seemed to work okay. The governor linkage was bent. I think the guys in India just put it together. This bolt here particularly was uh, totally uh, out of whack. The, um, so the fuel rack control lever over here, if you had done this before, it actually would have just stuck. It didn't, it didn't move on its own at all. So um, that's a weird shouldered bolt, so I ended up having to use the lathe to make a new one, and that came out pretty good. Um, standard spring stuff. I got uh, got the engine set for exactly 650 RPM, which on the reduction gets the generator running at uh, 1800. And between no load and full load, um, I'm running about 62 hertz no load and about 58 uh, under a 3000 watt load. So um, the regulation isn't fantastic, but it's good enough. The, uh, the fuel tank was uh, completely rusty. The paint they put on it, I don't think they took all the oil out because the paint was literally just crumbling off as I was working on it. So uh, that's uh, black Velspar, uh, four layers of it and under good primer and everything. It's fuel proof. It's, it's pretty good. The hoses they supplied with it were um, awful. There was a pet cock down there. I don't know if you remember that or not in some fittings and they all leaked. So um, I ended up tapping this for standard US threads on the tank. And then from there, it's just all U.S. stuff down to barb fittings, the fuel shut off. This is a stand pipe because uh, up over here, this is the blowback from the diesel injector. And um, it actually lets a little bit of pressure out. So over time, this, and I don't know where the air comes from because uh, there, there's no leaks in the system. Maybe it's just still working on things or a little bit of pressure coming back into it from combustion pressure. I'm not sure. But over time, this actually pushes a little bit of air. So if you notice down here, uh, I have this on an incline so that the air that pushes down actually bubbles up through and then can escape out of here, which is just vented to atmosphere. So that just goes, but the uh, uh, added bonus to that is that when you turn the fuel on, you'll notice that those bubbles rise up and then the fuel level itself, see if I can get that to show right, 
sits right here, so that's sort of a handy dandy quick at a glance fuel gauge also. Full tank of fuel, no problems. The, uh, the fuel filter on this was uh, embarrassingly terrible. So I made up a, a new plate over here that went where the fuel filter went, and that's a uh, uh, the fuel filter off a of John Deere 855 uh, compact tractor. Uh, John Deere is the local tractor company we have, so I uh, figured I can get filters, I can get cartridges, I can get all the replacement parts. So um, pretty much anything aftermarket on this, I tried to stick with John Deere just because it's right down the road, good quality, and it will work just fine. Uh, and then that runs down into the injection pump and, and out from there. Um, I ended up having to uh, polish all the valves. The, the tops were terrible. These little pushers were terrible. The tappets were uh, very rough. So everything got a really good polish while it was all apart and uh, goes, went back together. The injector was perfect. Uh, that is a very nice injector. Um, the head, I ended up having to have decked by a, or the, the head was uh, warped a little bit. The cylinder liner stuck out uh, about 12 thousandths, which is um, maximum is 4 thousandths. So what they did in India was the cylinder liner stuck out too much. And so when they cranked the head on it, they actually just warped everything fiercely. The, uh, the head gasket was bad. It did not hold coolant. So I ended up uh, taking it all apart again, having them deck the um, cylinder, replace the head gasket, and um, even then the, the, the head was still warped enough that it still weeped just a little bit, just a little bit of coolant. So I sort of had to um, grit my teeth, suck up my pride, and uh, use just a touch of RTV, high temp, around here when I put it together for the final time. No leaks, uh, good compression. Um, all that. This is funny. You'll notice that this is held in by four Phillips screws now because the uh, when they drilled these for the original rivets, they actually drilled right through the head. So uh, coolant seeped out of here. So I ended up pulling those rivets out, tapping that for 1224, and then uh, using sealant on screws to hold the plate back in. But um, there was a little bit of a creative language the night that I noticed that those rivets were leaking. Um, over here, this is the standard um, generator system, so uh, it's wired up right now for 240, 120 split phase. Um, standard diodes on that, but I didn't like the regulation I was getting on voltage, so um, the umbilical runs down here and then runs up to this control panel. I'll call it a control panel, there's no controls on it. Um, so I have 110, 240 coming up to here. There's a frequency meter and then two voltmeters, one for each phase, 120 volts on each, and a 120 volt hour meter. So you can see I've got about 15 hours on the engine run total, and uh, it does run the entire house, no complaints at all. Um, slight flicker to the lights, but you know when you're running a 60 hertz power on a 650 RPM engine, um, every here and there you will get one power stroke that just lights the lights just a little brighter. Um, good traction. On the, uh, on the pulley and everything, no squeaks, no anything. It's tightened up uh, quite a bit more than I thought it was going to have to, but it's because it's uh, tensioned up nicely here, but there's nothing over here. You can actually see slightly the uh, grooves in the paint being worn by this uh, multi-rib belt, but there's the flex. I mean, I'm pushing on that pretty hard. Not much flex. It's pretty tight. So uh, to get one of these started, actually, you know what? Why don't we do it right? See if I can do this with one hand. And you come over here and grab the oil can. Push it down a little. There we go. Run a little bit of oil into there, a little bit into there, a little across here. Get both of those good. Shoot a little bit into the side here to a uh, lube the valve stems two shots just to get it in the sump pretty or get it in there pretty good angle that in there one two perfect then you come over here send a shot into here uh, the linkage on that's pretty good let's see if I can rotate this just a touch you got to get your clearance into the injection pump right there I have a lousy angle for that. Let's see. There we go. So you can see where the injection pump is. Just run a little bit of oil on there. Perfect. Just to keep that. 
a little bit around here. One, two, just a touch. The uh, Those tappet stems are lubed from the inside once the engine's running, but it takes a little while to get them going. Now this bolt right here, the original Listers had an oil pump inside that lubed one of the uh, the cam bearing on this end, but the, uh, the splash lube Indian ones don't. So you take the stem and you bend it down just a touch, and you just send a little bit of oil straight down one, two, and it fills up a little funnel cup inside that theoretically is supposed to be lubricated while the engine's running, but uh, you just don't want to start it off dry. And then you put this back in hand tight is good enough. Now I just ran this the other day, so I do know the oil level is good. If you're in doubt, you can pull this out. There's the dipstick. And you're uh, pretty much good to go at this point. Now, uh, the cooling system on this, I gotta confess, I'm kind of proud of. It has no moving parts. I did uh, machine on the lathe this little spacer right here, which has a uh, an allowance for a Napa thermostat, a 195 degree thermostat. That gives it some space right there. So once we reach 195 on the cylinder head, that opens up. And this uh, is completely a thermosiphon. So it goes up. You can see all the hot lines are tilted upward. It goes up here. The very peak of the system is right here. That's the highest point. So any air coming out comes out there. It runs down to, this is a half gallon um, milk jug from the local dairy glass. It's a uh, high temperature rated. So from there, that's the high point. And then I have four sections of home heating baseboard, plenty of surface area in that, and you'll notice that every section has a slight downward tip to it. So uh, as the engine runs and the, uh, the coolant cools, gravity actually pulls it down because its density increases as it gets cooler. And then from there, that's a uh, slight angle downward and then right back in to the bottom of the engine. So it's uh, temperature regulated by the thermostat and the hotter the coolant gets, the faster it rises, the faster it pushes through here, and uh, then it just comes right back in. So no moving parts, and it regulates itself based on the thermostat and the temperature of the coolant itself. Um, there's enough surface area on all these pipes that it doesn't really need any forced air on it to keep it cool, just convection uh, lets it work. If I'm really worried about it, I might put some pieces of cardboard around it to uh, act as a baffle or duct work to uh, induce more draft. But so far it's pretty good. If I'm running it at a 3000 watt full tilt boogie for too long, you know, 20 minutes or so without giving it a break, I do have very shoddily mounted on the wall over here a, a little home desk fan. And I just plug that in and uh, set it to low and it just pushes enough air to keep that cool. So the cylinder holds uh, between 193 and about 205. Uh, no matter what I'm doing with it. So it runs plenty good. Uh, no complaints on that. So uh, everything else is just good. So why don't uh, it's about 35 degrees in the shop here. So why don't I see if we can get this thing to crank over uh, just so you can hear what it sounds like. Um, over here, you, I, I won't be able to talk too much. I don't know what the camera angle is going to be, but uh, this over here, let's set this just a little bit so you can see the exhaust valve come up. You swing that in. And that lets you roll the engine without uh, any compression. So you can do whatever you need to do. That, that way you can get it cranking nicely. Uh, you can see in there the um, injection ram is, is running. So that had to be timed. That was completely out of whack. Let's walk around here. I apologize. This video is getting a little bit long. Maybe I'll edit it. Maybe I won't. Uh, this lever over here is actually the shutoff. So when this is down, it lets the uh, fuel injection rack push whatever it needs to to maintain RPM. Right now, that's uh, that's completely open because the engine's running at zero speed. So that's uh, as much power per stroke as you can get. And then the right, the uh, governor inside, as the engine's running, adjust that against the spring, changes the amount of fuel going into the engine uh, to keep its speed maintained. But uh, for right now, that's off. So what you do is you put the uh, the crank on it. You get cranking over under no compression. Then you flip this down 
and listen for the fuel pressure to build up. You'll actually hear a distinct clink as the poppet valves open once fuel pressure builds. And once you start hearing that clink, you start crank, you keep cranking, and then slow, then you whip this decompressed lever over. And if all goes well, the very next compression stroke, it will have fuel and compression and it'll fire on its own. Then you just slowly walk the, uh, the crank off of this and you're good to go. All right, so let's try to give this sucker a shot. First of all, I hope you can see this. You put the crank on and you roll it backwards a few tries just to make sure the ratchet mechanism and everything's all good because you don't want to take your arm off, of course. So I'm satisfied with that. So we start cranking and uh, once we get up to a decent speed, we flip the fuel rack down, listen for the clinking, and once we hear it, we swing the decompressed lever to regular compression. So let's get it rolling. Ugh. So now that it's running, I hope you can hear me. We're gonna go over here. This uh, this only brings us from 240 dual phase and splits it out to uh, 120 each on single phases. We're gonna go over here and plug in uh, these two space here, the 1500 watts each. So, You can hear the engine bog down. So that's 1,500 watts per space heater for 3,000 watts total. We're gonna go over here. Ah, uh, she's running good. see we're running 60 hertz 120 volts per per phase that is one's a little higher than the other i think one of the space heaters draws just a little bit more power power meters running let's go outside Huh, a little less uh, snow out here than there was last time you were here, huh? Oh, there's the 855 tractor that I tried to keep all the parts consistent with. And there's my pipe that goes outside, just a couple of 2x4s under the door that have sealed the air out. You can see the carbon on the ground. Doesn't sound too bad from out here, huh? We'll run back inside. Back in the engine room. And she's ready to go again. Remember to shut the fuel off when you're done. And it's good to go. I hope that I showed you a pretty good picture of the whole thing.
Uh, really appreciate the work you gave me and uh, getting the engine here. I've been enjoying it. Thank you.